you. It's such an important thing for all of us to take time to count your blessings. We don't talk about that much anymore, do we? You don't hear people say, hey man, you gotta count your blessings. But it's an important part of life because things are coming at us all so quickly. I mean, life is happening. If you blink, you're gonna miss it, to quote good old Ferris Bueller, you know, for, for those of you who know that reference. But oftentimes, things are happening so quickly that we don't get a chance to stop and just thank God for what we have. I've been doing that a lot lately because, you know, it's the end of the school year and, and my oldest, Lynn and my oldest, Obadiah, you know, graduating high school this, you know, in just a couple days and, you know, getting ready to go to college. And I, I've been reflecting back to both when he was born and then when we moved up here, he was uh, in kindergarten, just like a little dude. And at the end of the year for all the seniors in high school, they have you go through the baby pictures, which is so cute, you know? Like, you're like, these kids, are there. how they get so cute and how they get so big. And, and, but you start to reflect back on it all. And, and you realize that in all of the journey of life, a lot of it is hard and challenging, but it's also beautiful, you know? And I was thinking about, for our son Obadiah, about two years ago, he, uh, he was uh, embarking on a skateboarding career. Actually, it was like his second time skateboarding, you know, and, and went to the skate park with his buddies. And I got a call after church, and it was like, hey, um, you got to go meet Obadiah at the skate park. He probably broke his leg. And I show up at the skate park, and Obadiah is laying down, his legs facing the wrong direction, it was pretty gnarly. And, and, and I remember just being like, okay, how's this going to work? And, you know, he ended up getting surgery, 17. He's got more metal in his ankle than most of us have in our garage. You know, he's got plates and screws and all this stuff. But I remember, at, you know, when, when this all happened, we, he was working through it. And he was sophomore year of high school. He was super excited. And, and I said, okay, so buddy, listen, we can either just lament this, say this is horrible, and we can be miserable or we can see this as somehow God wants to bring beauty out of this. So once you're done grieving, what you're not gonna get to do, you have to ask yourself, what are you gonna do? And Obadiah's like, Dad, I just wanna learn how to computer program. And so sure enough, like as he's recovering, he was sleeping downstairs because he couldn't get up the stairs in our house. And so in order to go to bed, Obadiah had me listening to like 10 hours of like people coding, <laughs> like talking about like, Listen, as a non-programmer, there's nothing more boring. It's almost like watching golf if you're not a golfer. There's like nothing more boring than sitting there and this guy's like, and if you do this, this, and he's talking. And half of these guys are like, they're from all over the world. So it's like, it's nighttime. It's like one in the morning. And then every time he doze off, I'd like shut it off so I can get some sleep. And then he'd wake up like an hour later and be like, where's my programming guy? Turn it back on again. <laughs> But what's funny is as we're going through this journey, now Obadiah is going to college for software development, where you realize that even something as tragic as a broken ankle can be a blessing because our God is a God of redemption. And I think we're so used to focusing on the negative in our culture that we have failed to remember that we have been abundantly blessed. I mean, just think about it, like we're, you know, for those of us who are here in the Crossroads Sanctuary, we realize we have lots of people joining us online and on TV and on the radio and all these things. If you're in the room, the fact that we can worship openly, I've traveled to places where you go to a worship services and there's no sign on the building and you can't just go and praise God. You can't just put a Jesus bumper sticker on your car. I've been those places in, in the globe. They're there today. 
if you're watching online, the, the, the technology we have today, all of it is a blessing. And what you realize is that our God is a God of blessing. But as it relates to the blessings of God, we have to remember the purpose for which God has blessed us. And I'm here to tell you, God has not blessed you so that you can brag to everybody how blessed you are. God has not blessed us so that we can hoard those blessings. But really, what God wants to do in each of our lives is work in our hearts and souls and minds so that every time we experience the blessings of God, our next thought is, who can I share this with? I'm here to tell you, my friends, God's blessings in your life are designed so that you can be a vehicle for his blessings to reach other people. I guarantee you, if, you go, if we go around the whole sanctuary, we grab everyone online, we say, listen, tell me a story about somebody who blessed you. I guarantee it will involve a person taking of what they had, either skills or time or talent, and choosing to invest them in you, choosing to show up for you when you needed it. It's an example of somebody who has used the blessing that they have to be a blessing. And so in this essential series, I realize that if we're gonna get down to the main things of the things of God's kingdom, we need to grapple with the idea of the blessings of God. And so I have a beautiful, short psalm that I wanna share with you today. So everyone open your Bible to the book of Psalms. We're gonna take Psalm 67 today, Psalm 67. So open up your Bibles. The book of Psalms, the biggest book in your Bible, there's 150 of those Psalms. They're also called songs, right? So flip around, you can't miss, it's kind of like right, almost right in the middle of your Bible. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, there's Bibles on the seats in front of you. I want you to be able to read along with me, or of course you could use your phone. And as I said, Psalm 67, and so uh, that's between Psalm 66 and 68. <laughs> they haven't changed that on us yet. At some point, we're gonna realize our numbering system was wrong. Every way we did everything was wrong, but for now, it still sits in there pretty decently. Psalm 67, right in there. Listen to what this, I'm gonna read you the whole Psalm. It, it, it's seven verses in totality. It says this, God be merciful to us, and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Silah, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. Verse three, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth, Selah, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. It's a beautiful psalm, isn't it? Now, notice how it begins. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known in your, on the earth and your salvation among the Gentiles. This is just something so simple. You and I, we need to let those blessings abound because they're everywhere. The question for us is, are we willing to acknowledge the blessings that we're experiencing? And I love this if you've been around Crossroads at all, if you've ever not boogied out before the end of the service, for those of you who do that, you know who you are. <laughs> we close the end of every service with God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Now, if you don't know where that comes from, it's Numbers chapter six, verses 24 to 26. It's the high priestly blessing. God told Aaron, all the priests, now at, when the people were together, you say to them, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That high priestly prayer was important because it reminded 
the people every day of three things. First, God's protection. May the Lord bless you and keep you. That speaks of God's protecting hand over us. Second, God's favor or God's grace, where it says, the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. God's favor, like, like a proud parent with their child. I, I, I love when babies are born because I always, or like when you talk to a grandparent or a parent, you're always like, oh, let me see pictures. And of course, they're already taking their phone out. They got Polaroids. Even if the kid looks mangled on entry, it's the cutest kid ever, right? As it should be. Because the parent and the grand, the face is shining upon that little child. So not only protection and favor, but of course, God's peace. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you what? Peace. We talked about that last week, didn't we? If you were here last week. Peace, that word shalom. Ultimate flourishing. The way everything's supposed to be. See, the, the priest's job was to remind the children of Israel that God's protection is there for them. God's favor is there for them and God's peace is there for them. And now in Psalm 67, it's not the priest declaring it over the people, but it's the psalmist saying, God, be merciful to us, the people, and bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. Now it's saying, God, will you do what you have said that you want to do in our lives? And then there's this word, selah. Everyone look at the first text you say, selah. Now you could say it's selah or selah. You could slap it however you want to. In the Psalms, that word has two functions. First, it's a musical function because these are all songs. So when the selah happened, it was designed to be a moment for things to stop, to exhale, for things to land. In our very quick culture, sometimes things just need to stop and take some root in our heart, right? But it was also a moment when it stops and takes root. Some rabbinical scholars would say that the word literally means to uprise or to rise up. In a sense, as you let it land and as there's a pause, the soul rises to God. So every time you see the word selah, when you're reading the Psalms, I want you to stop. Let what was just said, let it land. And then allow your soul to rejoice in God. Now, let me read it again. God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. I want to tell you something about you. God's face shines upon you. My friends, God's face shines upon you. God's face rejoices at the thought of you. How powerful is that? Now, if you're like me, you think, well, listen, how's that possible? Because like, I'm a little crazy. Like, I'm a little jacked up. I had a funky week, right? Like, you have to remember that God's love for you is not because you and I are the most lovable people, but because he is loving at the essence of who he is. It says that for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that who would ever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What it's saying is that God loves us when we're lost. It's shocking to me. I think about my life before Jesus. I can't even fathom the holy God, his face shining upon me because I was jacked up. But my Bible says he loved me with an everlasting love. Now, I didn't know it, and I was not responding to that love at all. God looks past our brokenness. 
He sees us without all of the addictions and all the trappings, and he sees who he created, and he's like, that's my child. Like any parent, like any parent, you love your child no matter how good or bad they do. No matter how heartbreaking their decisions are, you still love them even though you hate what they're doing. We do that because our Father in heaven who created us does the same thing. Now don't get me wrong, you get to experience the fullness of God's mercy the fullness of his blessings and his protection and his keeping and grace when we receive his son, Jesus. Without it, we will never know the joy of God in our presence. We'll never know how God sees us. And that is why it is so important, no matter where you are on your faith journey, that you say, I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. And not just... So you can check it off on a census form. But you're like, I want to walk with Jesus. Because only in Christ will we ever begin to even begin to fathom the depths of the riches of God's glory, his favor, his love. The only way any human being can know the blessings of God is through the finished work of Jesus. When all of a sudden a person is justified because of their faith in Jesus and his death on the cross, all of a sudden our eyes begin to be opened, even if in the beginning just a little bit. And then the next day a little bit more and a little bit more. We grow in the understanding of the favor of God. And I'm here to tell you, don't believe the misconception that the favor of God means nothing goes wrong. The favor of God means everything can go wrong, but because God is with you, there's something beautiful about it all. Don't believe for a second that the favor of God is when you get everything you want. My friends, no, you don't even know what you need. God doesn't give us what we want. He gives us what he knows we need. And when you trust him, no matter how hard it is, the favor of God is that God, I don't understand this. I don't like it. But obviously, you have a plan. So I'm going to trust you, God. That's where, that's where God's blessings abound. And I believe for some of you here today, th this is what you came to church to hear. God's word has it for you. Don't believe that unfortunate circumstances mean that you do not have the favor of God. Do not believe that God's face is not shining upon you because things aren't going the way you want them to, do, to go. Martin Luther, the great reformer, in one of his hymns said, behind a frowning providence, there is a smiling face. And the key for us, like Peter and the disciples when they were in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, we have to learn to look beyond the situation and look to the Savior. Look beyond the storm and look to Christ. My friends, the blessings of God are all yours in Christ. We, we sang it today, didn't we? All your promises are what? Yes and amen. That's right out of 2 Corinthians. So they, just, they just took a scripture verse, they put it to music, we sing it, we dance around, it's awesome. But it's true. So we need to let these blessings abound. But now notice, after the Selah in verse two, it says that your way may be known on earth and your salvation among the nations. Now, this starts to show us when God blesses us and he keeps us and he's merciful to us and his face is shining upon us and we realize that we are the delight of God. We realize that that's just not supposed to be, okay, that helps me feel good about myself and it helps my self-esteem, it helps my sense of purpose. Yeah, all that is there. But notice that your way may be known on the earth, that your salvation among the nations. Now look at what goes on in verse three. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. And what's the word? Selah. My friends, what does this teach us? And I get it right out of here. We need to let the nations be glad. I love that. God blesses us so that the nations can be glad. I love that phrase because God has blessed us so that we now become a blessing to the world in Jesus' name. And the biggest mistake we make, and I get part of it is our culture, where when we get blessed, like, like, like the old stories, like when the tax return comes in, you're like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to spend that. I'm going to get myself a jacuzzi. 
I'm going to get myself a mani-pedi. I'm going to go get myself my, I'm going to get my hair extensions or whatever, like whatever your thing is. I'm going to, you know, and I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'm saying maybe God wants you to might do other things and maybe just do like one of your three spa day things because other people might need to receive some of that blessing that is yours. See, the problem with American culture is our culture is over, economically, we, we run on anxiety. And if you look at the, the psychology of economic anxiety, when people are anxious, they begin to hoard. And when people begin to hoard their blessings, then it creates more anxiety because God actually created us to be those pass-throughs of blessing into the world. So really, that's why you're more blessed to give than to receive. I would say Jesus is also saying you're more blessed to give than to hold on to it. I'm not saying you shouldn't save for retirement. I'm not saying you shouldn't be wise with your finances. I'm saying, but if everything we do terminates on us, it makes sense. It just keeps breeding more anxiety because we're not a part of God's kingdom economy where we give and we trust that God will provide. Listen to how God spoke to Abram. We know him better as Abraham. This is in Genesis chapter 12, verses one to three. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, God is telling Abraham, listen, I want you to, he's like, I want you to take a step of faith at a time when people never left their families. Not like today where it's like, man, I got a job over here, so I was gonna go there, you know? It's like people stayed with their families. And God's like, no, I want you to leave your family and I want you to go to a place, I'm gonna show you where you're going. How many of you would really love it if God did that to you? Like, I want you to pack up your car and start driving east. I'll show you when you get there. Let's be honest. In, in American culture, like 97% of us would be like, I'm not going anywhere. If I don't know where I'm going, then I'm not going. But that's what he did to Abram. He's like, listen, I want you to go. I'm going to show you. But then he says, listen, I'm going to do a work in you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. At this point, Abram was married. They never had any kids. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to bless you, and everyone's going to know about you, Abram. People are like, oh, yeah, right on. I'm going to be getting me some, I'm going to be influencer on YouTube. People are going to watch me make some cakes, and everyone's going to love my cakes. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be on Gordon Ramsay. He's going to be coming on my show. He's going to love my buttercream. Anyway. But he says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing so far that in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's, God's saying, look, he's not saying, Abraham, I want to bless you because it's going to be cool. He's saying, I'm going to bless you so that I can bless through you. And my friends, that's not just true of Abraham. That is true of all of us. If we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, you are part of the blessing. This is why we talk about Abraham today. He's that patriarch of faith. God called Abraham. He's saying, listen, I'm going to bless every nation through you because the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, is going to be born from your lineage. That's why the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, begins with a genealogy. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, he's saying, look, Jesus is this blessing. And because God has blessed us with Jesus, then he's saying, I want to bless through you. And it's one of the things I love so much about what God is doing here at Crossroads. And I want to thank you all for your joyful willingness. I mean, I just, just we have this summer groups launch. We launched over 100 groups last week. Give yourselves a round of applause. People willing just to say, hey, listen, I'm going to pick a pace. I'm going to find a friend. I'm going to select a study. I'm going to go. Because I'm going to, because God has done a work in me, I'm just going to reach out to somebody and say, hang out. That's fun. And we say over 100 groups because we don't know exactly how many because some groups are off book. You know, like I, my son got one of those calls. Like, hey, dude, let's, let's go to coffee tomorrow. We're going to have a study. 
And Obadiah's like, man, what's going on? My, you're, you told me that my dad, he's like, your dad said we need to hang out and have a Bible study. He's like, what'd you do? What'd you do? And I'm like, I, I didn't do anything. He's like, you tell everyone I need to go to a Bible study? I'm like, well, of course. But I'm like, oh no, it's summer groups launch. I'm like, oh yeah, they just grabbed hold of that thing. Let's do it. And I love that. But when you do that, you're saying, God, you're doing a work in my life. I don't have all the answers, but I want my life to be a blessing to someone else. So I'm just gonna take a step of faith. Yesterday was second Saturday. 130 of you got together. Go just roll up your sleeves and serve in our community. Collected 1,700 jars of peanut butter and jelly. People just came back from a mission trip to Cuba. People just came back from a mission trip to the Middle East. You, have, you know, it's like stuff's going on all over the place. And then people are serving all over the place. It's like people are walking in this, hey, I want to help the nations be glad. And what I love about this is the reminder for us here is that God's plan is always a global plan, not just a local plan. God has a heart for the nations. I want you to take a moment. I want you to look around the sanctuary. Go ahead, everyone look around. Everyone online, I want you to put those little I things in the comment section right now. You're looking around. Look at all the nations represented here. I mean, it's pretty incredible when you think about it. For the Jewish people, they, Israel in biblical times, much today, is about the size of New Jersey. My home state, right on. Right? But not nearly as populated. And because we didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles, traveling out, people didn't go all over the place. Obviously, as the Roman Empire built, then people would get around the Roman Empire. But like, People weren't going everywhere like they're going today. And the beauty is, is that the reason of all the different ethnicities in the room right now and online, the reason we all know Jesus is because somebody was blessed to know Jesus and they decided, I'm going to go cross-cultural. I'm going to go bring the gospel to other people. Just last week, we had some loved ones from our, our fellowship. They're in Cameroon serving Jesus. They're probably watching online right now. Right? We have people from coming all over. We've had some sisters in town from India. Watch us online, right? We have missionaries. If we go get a coffee in the Love Now Cafe, there's a list. We have missionaries all over the globe. We have people going all of, why? Because when you've been blessed by God and you put your faith in, in Jesus, all of a sudden the nations get glad. And I love this. Because, and listen, I always love stepping on people's political toes. It's, like, it's one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> Make people feel a little uncomfortable. But listen, whatever your politics are, if you're a Christian, you realize that God has a heart for every nation. And we realize that when it all winds down, every tribe, nation, and tongue is going to be represented in heaven. And so whatever our foreign policy views are in the present moment, politically, we need to have a kingdom mindset. God doesn't throw out any group of people. God doesn't write, now don't get me wrong, there's immigration, I get all that. Security concerns, get all that. That's all real stuff. But for Christians, the priority is we want the gospel to go everywhere. And if we find ourselves despising any group of people, that's what we call racism, we realize that's not the heart of God. It's never been the heart of God, and it never will be the heart of God. You know how I know? Listen to Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. A little view of heaven, Right? And if you don't like this, get mad at the Holy Spirit. Because I didn't write it. <laughs> That's my new favorite line. <laughs> After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Can I get an amen? Yeah. In heaven. It's even cooler than the United Nations. Everyone doesn't have their little placard what nation they're from. We're all just together praising God. Every tribe, nation, Peoples, and, like every division is gone. We're all there. They're all wearing right robes because they've been forgiven and purified. And they're praising Jesus. Salvation belongs to our God. And I love 
that our God is that kind of a God. And I also have listened, if you're here today, and I realize, depending on how we were raised, we're all in the process of unlearning a bunch of garbage we learned growing up, right? All of us. And so if you're on that journey where you're like, man, I do kind of look down on this person. I don't really like this. Or if people are like, Fusco, I'd look down on you if you got a nicer haircut, you know? If you're in that journey, write down Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Because when, when we're in heaven, I can't wait to be in heaven. People who think that I can't be in heaven because I have great hair. I'll be like, I'm here, goodbye grace. You're stuck with me for eternity. High five in Jesus' name, you know? There's all these people they think because they have their little theological picadillos that they're the only ones in heaven. What a rude awakening that God's grace is so much bigger than this stuff. It's gonna be so cool. I just imagine we roll on in and they're like, I can't believe Fusco made it. I'm like, God's grace is that big? Yes. To like all the crossroads people are here. Get me out of here. No. <laughs> but listen, when God is blessing you, let God bless you. Listen to this again. Because by, by verse two, God blesses us. He's merciful to us. He causes faith to shine. That your way be, may be known on earth and your salvation among all the nations, among all the peoples. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Think about all the places on the globe right now where people are not glad. I mean, we live in a day and age where we have images from across the globe. I remember what it was like in the 80s when we got the first kind of video images out of Africa, the starvation in Africa. And I remember being like, it's on the, I'm eating dinner with the TV on. Some of you were raised that way, right? It's like your family's around the TV. And I remember watching it and we have food everywhere. And I'm like, I don't like this. And like, I'm like, what are we doing? My mom's like, what are we doing? You realize that's still a problem today. You realize in our community, there's still one out of every three kids are still food insecure. It's something we're working on as a church. That means that kids don't know what they're gonna eat in our own community, in Clark County, Washington. These, these are needs, and as believers, we see this and we say, how do we let the nations be glad? How do we engage because of what God has done for us? How do we then help? Because when people are starving, it's hard to be glad. That's why we're committed to clean water. We're committed to all these things as a church family because of this stuff. Because we want people from every tribe, nation, and tongue to be blessed, to have what they need. The things that will help them to not just survive, but to thrive. And that takes all of us being involved in that. You know, we're gonna follow up with you. You know, we ended up raising about $130,000 on our Love Now special offer. Give yourselves a round of applause. We funded every project. It was so cool. And we sat down as leaders. We're like, maybe our vision was too small. <laughs> you know, maybe we have to think more expansively of what God wants to do. Because as a church, we realize that what God has blessed us with, we want to now be a blessing to others. How can we help more, more significantly, more substantially? Now, I love this that phrase, let the nations be glad. For those of you who read your Bible every day and a lot, if you read other books, I, I wanna recommend there's a book by this title, Let the Nations Be Glad by a pastor named John Piper. He's since retired. Maybe one of the best small books on God's global plan. I remember someone gave it to me when I was a young pastor said, here, you should read this book. It was a small book. And that book blew my mind. So blessed by it. It's a whole theology of God's heart for the globe, all from this verse that our goal is to let the nations be glad. Why? They're glad because his way is known in the earth. Salvation has come to the nations. It says that he will judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. That reminder that no matter who the physical leaders or political or military leaders are, there is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords behind that. And for the people of God, we always remember, no matter who our governmental leaders are, we still follow the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our allegiance is not to the current king or president of Babylon. 
Instead, it's to Jesus, the King of heaven and all the earth. Now look at how this Psalm closes, verse five. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. My friends, we need to let the earth be fruitful. See, this is literally speaking about God's physical provision. Let the earth, then the earth shall yield her increase. It's speaking about God's creation fulfilling its purpose to provide for everything. And really what the idea here is that if you look at the creation account of Genesis chapter one, God has created everything for that peace, that human flourishing. But there's so many issues. And we should be praying that God's good creation will yield all the fruit that it wants to. Now, don't miss this. Verse three and verse five, we have this repetition. Let the peoples praise you, O God, that all the peoples praise you. That's why as a church, we, we play, place a priority in our worship services on praising God, singing songs, worshiping him. Can I encourage you all? Make praising God not only just a public discipline, but a private one. You, we should be the kind of people who we praise God in private. And don't get me wrong. I love when Pastor Mikey's singing. I love when all of our worship team, Peyton and Matthew and, you know, Jody, they're all singing and, and they're phenomenal. But I'm here to tell you, you don't need good singers for great worship. You need a willing heart for great worship. That's all you need because God is worthy. When was the last time in your prayer time you were just like, oh, Lord, you rock. Like, Lord, you're the best. Like, Lord, I can't even believe this, that I get to talk with you right now. God, thank you for your grace. Live life. Let all the peoples praise you. Man, I want to encourage you, let your life, live a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of praise. That when we get together in the sanctuary, that we just get to do it with our brothers and sisters. But live a life of praise. And I love this because it says, once again, let all the peoples praise you. This is what it's about God receiving the rightful praise for how blessed he has given us. And let the earth yield her increase. Now, notice, it says, the earth yield or increase. Now, we don't think about this too much because by and large, for most of us, we don't live very close to the land in the sense that it's not like, like back in the day when this was being written, maybe at the time of David, at, Jesus, at the time of Jesus, like people in your community grew stuff and you would trade or they'd sell it. Now we just go to Costco. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, oh man, it's out of season, but I get, I get my peaches from this place and this thing comes from this place. And, and then listen, you know, because of Costco, I got like a freezer full of meat Back in the day, it's like you either ate it or it rotted, unless you put a lot of salt on it. It still rotted much quicker than you wanted it to. So the idea of needing the daily bread, the earth giving its regular increase, was a big thing. Because if the earth didn't bring its increase, people starved. So seeing God's tangible provision, but there's also another type of increase that God is interested in. Listen to John chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus said this, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. One of the ways the earth bears its increase is when you and I are fruitful in the things of God's kingdom. When love grows, when peace grows, when patience grows, when joy grows, when kindness grows, grows, faithfulness, when that grows, when self-control grows, when goodness in our hearts and lives grow, when people used to cut us off and we'd try and yell at them through your window and their window and you show them different fingers and not the one way to heaven finger or you're doing a great job. When you stop doing that, you're bearing fruit. When you used to be a know-it-all, and now you still think you're a know-it-all, but you don't say it. <laughs> That's the earth yielding its increase. 
And then at some point, like, maybe I don't know everything. Right? I mean, I do this all day. And in each one of our lives, I'm here to tell you, in each one of our lives, God is bearing fruit. For some of you right now, because I know some people are like, well, Fusco, you don't get it. Like, I was doing so good, now I'm not doing good. Listen, sometimes it's pruning season. Sometimes new seeds are just getting in. It's going to take some time. We just transplanted a plant in my yard. I should not be gardening. I'm bad at it. But like, it's going to make it. I'm like, oh man. Like, Lynn's like, I think you killed it. I'm like, I may have. But I tried. But like right now, like I'm not expecting that thing to be super fruitful. I'm just hoping it just doesn't die by the time I get home from church today. And for some of us, that's where we are right now. It's like you just got transplanted. And God's, it's like right now, it's like it's, you're just trying to figure out where it is. Listen, God wants to bear fruit in your life. And God is glorified when his disciples are bearing this fruit. So let the work of the Spirit in your life be this blessing, the earth yielding its fruit. And I love how this ends. God, our own God shall bless us. God shall bless us and all of the ends of the earth will fear him. And don't miss this because it's like, oh, it's so beautiful. God, God, our own God's going to, oh, he's going to bless us. And it's like, and all the ends of the earth are going to fear him. That sounds loud to people. No, no, The fear of the Lord in the Bible is the beginning of wisdom. It is a total blessing when we realize that God is God and we are not. And because God could speak the universe into existence, it makes total sense that we're kind of scared because we are finite and God is infinite. We are not knowing a whole lot and God is all knowing. God is omnipresent. God is always everywhere and we're stuck right where we are when we're there. So in the light of the reality of the God who created and sustains everything, who hears every prayer, who's numbered every hair on every head, even those of you who your hair is under the skin, he still knows, he knows those follicles, he sees those babies in there. Some of you right now, he's like, you got more hair than Fusco. Ha, ha, ha. Nobody knows. Anyway, that God causes us to stand in awe. That God causes us to say to ourselves, oh, this God's a consuming fire. This is the God who I fear. And when we fear the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom. You know why it's the beginning of the wisdom? When a person does not fear the Lord, all the other things that they know is out of order because they think that they are the decider of all things. The reason the fear of the Lord is necessary for all wisdom is because not even understanding our place in the created order makes everything else foolishness. Once we realize God is God, he created me, my life is accountable to him, then all knowledge lands in its rightful place. And when all the nations the ends of the earth fear the Lord, then God's blessing is abounding everywhere because everybody is experiencing his blessing, walking in his blessing and enjoying his blessing and choosing to share those blessings with everybody else. And then the global community under the authority of Jesus with everyone doing their part playing their role in it all. It all is blessed and it all works. And God is glorified for it. Sound good? Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you that you are merciful to us, that you have blessed us, that, Lord, thank you that you're countenance radiates joy because that's who you are. Lord, we ask that you would not only, that we would not only count our blessings and acknowledge your grace and favor and, and, and peace in our lives, but Lord, we would not just hold it to ourselves, but God, that we would just let it flow through our lives. That we would bless those with the ble- others with the blessing that we've received. That we would love those with the love that we've received. That we would be gracious to people with the grace that we have received. That we would hope with and for people with the hope that we've received. 
And God, we want all the nations of the earth to be glad, to sing for joy. We want all the peoples to praise you. We want all the ends of the earth to fear you so that your blessings might be the experience of the global community. And God, we ask today, because we don't have control over everything, we only have responsibility of our own lives. God, will you help us to be a people of praise, a people of adoration, a people of wonder. And God, that you would help us to expand our ability and capacity to bless others as you have blessed us.